Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Roland Leiker. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the second seminar in our seminar series in Legal Science and International Studies. It is also the second joint seminar with the Visual Politics Program. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that we uh, meet on Aboriginal land at a time of undisputed or disputed legal conflict. And in fact, two of the seminar series we'll be having this semester deal with precisely this kind of conflict uh, on land and on indigenous settler relationships. I just want to flag in briefly. We have on the 10th of September, uh, Professor Sarah Madison talking about the book, Colonial, The Colonial Fantasy, Why White Australia Can't Solve Black <coughs> Problems. This will be an event that is held uh, in the city, uh, co-sponsored with the Australian Institute of International Affairs uh, on a Tuesday evening, so it will be uh, circulating uh, details on that later on. Then the second uh, uh, event uh, on that topic will be on the 11th of, of October, Dr. Sana Nakata, on sort of the ethical issues of growing up indigenous in Australia. So I think there'll be two events that deal uh, directly with these issues. But before that, we have the first two seminars, which are more in the realm of peace and conflict studies, and particular, and some of our coincidence, on the links between the visual and questions of jurisprudence and transitional justice and peace building. We had three weeks ago uh, a seminar with Rene Jeffrey on how these issues work out in the context of Cambodia. And today we have Eliza Gansi on a very similar issue and in many ways in dialogue with Rene on how visual jurisprudence works in the context of South Africa. Uh, and we're very pleased to have Eliza with us today, uh, Dr. Gansey is a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cambridge. And her uh, talk will in many ways uh, present part of her book that's coming out with Cambridge University Press, which is called The Justice of Visual Art, Creative State Building in Times of Global Transition. Uh, her work is very interdisciplinary dealing with uh, both uh, peace and conflict studies, international relations, visual politics, international law, and sort of piecing them together in ways that hasn't really been uh, done before. Um, but I will um, uh, leave it at that. We have the format is as usual. We, um, Eliza will talk for about 40, 45 minutes. We have question and answer. And we will afterwards head to St. Lucy's for coffee. So if you would like to come along, and I particularly encourage uh, uh, postgraduate students, if you have time and interest, if you'd like to come along to meet Eliza informally, to continue the discussion afterwards, you'll be very welcome uh, to join us. But for now, uh, let's welcome Eliza, and I look forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start by saying a very big thank you, in particular to Roland, for so kindly organising today and welcoming me um, to be part of this seminar series. And thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and also to be among so many people um, that have inspired my research and really had such um, a great influence on my research. So as Roland mentioned, my paper today is based on my forthcoming book, The Justice of Visual Art. So in the next 40 minutes, I'm going to introduce really the governing thought that underpins my research um, and the three key contributions and kind of major claims that I'm making in the book. Um, and I'll start by just flagging these very briefly and then through the rest of the presentation go on to outline them in a bit more detail. So, when governments sanction mass violence against people within their borders and when large portions of the population commit human rights violations against other parts of the population, how is it possible to reconcile nations and achieve justice? It's not possible to simply imprison uh, large portions of the population, and no single legal measure can possibly comprehend or respond to the diverse claims of both individuals and groups who are affected directly and indirectly by conflict. So what else can be done? The governing thought that underpins my research is that there are aesthetic and creative ways to pursue transitional justice. And these are ways which have the capacity to address identity divisions and exclusions in order to understand and respond to the diverse claims of people affected by conflict. 
as well as the intergenerational trauma, the social injustices, and the deep grievances, which are both the result of conflict, but also its long-term uh, cause. And so this argument speaks uh, to current debates across international relations, human rights and transitional justice, as well as art theory and memory studies around how to best address violent and traumatic pasts, how to reconcile divided nations, and how to strengthen democratic institutions uh, in the aftermath of conflict. So in the book, I use a detailed case study of post-apartheid South African visual art in two major state-sponsored institutions in order to demonstrate that there are these aesthetic and creative ways to pursue transitional justice. And these institutions are the South African Pavilion at the Venice Art Biennale, uh, which is a global art exposition that brings together around 85 states to stage exhibitions, and at the Constitutional Court of South Africa, which houses a large visual art collection developed by the court and for the court. So as part of my doctoral research, um, I conducted 11 months of participant observation at these institutions, um, which included 130 semi-structured interviews um, with key stakeholders, such as judges, government representatives, staff members, um, artists, and uh, visitors to these institutions, as well as archival research. And so that's the kind of data I'm drawing on um, to make the arguments and claims I do in the book. The book makes three key contributions and corresponding arguments. First, it develops a theoretical framework for understanding transitional justice in visual art. And this framework shows how art plays a vital role in shaping and communicating the narratives of individuals so that they take on collective importance. And in doing so, the past can be shared so that a new political future can be imagined. The book also develops novel conceptions of visual jurisprudence and cultural diplomacy as forms of transitional justice. And so when I'm talking about visual jurisprudence, what I'm referring to is, is, is really the theory of the visual in law. So one of the main arguments I make is that the art collection at the Constitutional Court is a kind of visual jurisprudence in which the assumptions of justice and what it means to uphold a new constitution in the face of the apartheid past can be probed. And I also argue that the narratives of transitional justice, which emerge uh, from the South African pavilion at the Venice Biennale, position the state as continuing to heal its internal wounds while constructing itself as an archetype of political transition in order to re-establish its membership um, amongst the international community. So in the book, I make several claims, and very briefly these are that art enables and supports transitional justice, art communicates justice in powerful and meaningful ways, art embeds justice on different political levels, both the local and the global, art becomes a radical form of political participation in times of transition, and art is critical to the perception and to the provision of justice in South Africa. Consequently, art needs to be more widely considered by political institutions. So as a result, uh, the research shifts um, some of the more legalistic conceptions of transitional justice which tend to dominate the field um, by demonstrating that a holistic approach needs to include the legal, social and cultural processes uh, which in which visual art has a significant role. So moving on to, to unpack the three key contributions of the book in more detail, I begin by developing a theoretical framework um, I mentioned for understanding the relationship between transitional justice and visual art. And I do this through a close visual analysis and a, a really a narrative investigation of one artwork. And this artwork is called Rewind. It's by Gerhard Marx, Meyer Marx and Philip Miller, um, which was exhibited in the 2013 pavilion uh, at the Venice Biennale. So Rewind is an audio-visual installation and it's based on testimonies given during the public hearings of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the TRC. It consists of operatic cantatas, which present an archive of reimagined voices in an act of remembering, and images are projected on television screens which really respond to these testimonies. So the artwork, I suggest, embodies a literal and a conceptual meeting point between transitional justice and visual art. Because the TRC unfolds through Rewind, and Rewind is given form through the TRC. 
So the images on the screen are show rewind as it was exhibited at the 2013 Venice Biennale um, and some of the details of the films from this installation. So to give you a sense of the artwork, I'm going to play a really short excerpt uh, of one of the films, which is based on the testimony of Eunice Meyer, who is the mother of one of the people killed, Jabulani Meyer, during what later became known as the Gugu Letters 7 incident, uh, when in 1986, seven young anti-apartheid activists were shot by members of the South African Police Service. rewind to develop a theoretical framework that's based on four ideas which make art exigent and meaningful to transitional justice and vice versa. And the first idea is about the circulation of political sentiment. That is, memories and emotions, uh, what I group together as sentiment, circulate and rewind, generating an expectation that the process of reconciliation begins with, in, with the projection of a past that is in need of remembering a past remembered so that it's not repeated. The second idea is about the mediation of political agency. Political agency is mediated through the retelling of people's stories and through the reimagining of their testimonies in artistic form. In Rewind, people are visible and become visible through the processes by which the artwork came to be created and exhibited, through the experience of the artwork and this mediated truth and through the associations the artwork sends out into the world um, as politics revolves around what is seen and said and who has the ability to see it and say it. So the third idea is about the invitation of political encounters. Uh, Rewind performs a kind of transitional justice in the openings invited by aesthetic encounters. The TRC is aesthetically reworked. Its visual spectacle is evoked through the hanging line of headphones um, in the installation. At the same time, it's questioned through the way in which testimonies are selectively transposed and received. And through these encounters, the artwork becomes an artistic intervention in South Africa's transitional justice narrative, which is emerging in the wake of apartheid. And the final idea is about the invention of political space. Rewind invites and invents um, physical, symbolic and effective spaces which shape and reflect how South Africa's transitional justice narrative is performed, uh, presenting an image of the state seeking to continue to heal its internal wounds while offering itself as an archetype of political transition. And so the theorisation of these four <coughs> ideas um, really frame two central arguments. And the first argument arises out of a general meeting of art and transitional justice that an account of transitional justice without aesthetic dimensions is insufficient. And it's insufficient precisely because transitional justice is a process that is inseparable from feelings of justice, from justice being seen, felt, and thought to be done. Artworks offer insightful visions and experiences which have an afterlife beyond their creation, and they can fill out effective topologies in ways that facilitate or stimulate recognition and the feelings of experience. They can provoke us to travel into others' worlds, thinking and feeling our way into their universe. And this recognition is really essential in order to comprehend and respond to the diverse claims of indi individuals and groups, as I mentioned before, affected both directly and indirectly by conflict. So this is really a normative argument that, that, that underpins the whole book. And on that note, I just want to play a second very short excerpt from the artwork 
which emphasizes this idea about feelings of justice and effective connections uh, prompted by the artwork. And it's an excerpt based on testimony uh, by a mother about the murder of her son uh, who was shot by security police at the age of 11. argument emerges from a specific focus on rewind, that art plays an important role in animating and activating the narratives of individuals so that they take on a collective importance. Rewind shares individual stories of pain and suffering so that they can be effectively accessed uh, and interpreted by viewers. And in doing so, the past of one person becomes the present of many people so that a new political future can be imagined. And this is the importance of establishing um, a shared collective vision of the past has really become something of a trope in transitional justice discourse. So examining Rewind offers aesthetic insight that is both central to understanding South Africa's transition and simultaneously constitutive of that transition. The artwork functions to produce and maintain the state's transitional justice narrative, but it also opens up spaces for new political thinking new political possibilities and actions in this narrative. The invented physical, symbolic and effective spaces of Rewind shape how South Africa's transitional justice narrative takes on domestic and international significance. So in part one of the book, I explore transitional justice at the national level through the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Established at the point of a uh, transition from apartheid to democracy, the court was built on the site of several former notorious prisons, and probably the most well-known of these was called Number 4, where virtually every political prisoner uh, in South Africa in the 20th century, including Mandela and Gandhi, uh, were incarcerated at some point. So in the image on the screen, you can see um, the rainbow facade of the court, and to the left of which is the part um, is part of the old number four prison, um, which has been preserved as a museum. The court building is a unique space by international comparison, not only because it has transformed this penal site, but because it incorporates artworks into the fabric of the building and houses a large visual art collection developed by and for the court. So I've included three images on the screen um, to give you a sense of how art is integrated and displayed at the court. On the left um, are the public entrance doors to the court, which display South Africa's Bill of Rights carved in sign language into the wood. In the centre is the public entrance foyer of the court, and to the right is the public art gallery, which connects the main chamber and the library. So by tracing the court's development with a particular focus on the unique policies and processes through which the art collection actually came into being, I argue that art has been a really central component of the most significant institution to emerge out of South Africa's transition, and it continues to be so. Because the court is founded on justice, uh, focused on justice, sorry, uh, but founded on art. And when establishing the court, Judges weren't on the sidelines as uh, future inhabitants of the courtrooms, but rather they were on the front line pushing and prioritising art to actually be at the heart of this institution. So I then examine the spatial politics of the court. And the court's art collection um, and architecture are intended to symbolise the values of the constitution. I explore five themes which are critical to justice and dominant in the discourse about the court, both in how people speak about the court um, and in how the court chooses to portray itself. So four of these themes refer to values uh, that are rooted in and fostered by the Constitution, and these being accessibility, equality, dignity, and freedom of expression, while the fifth theme, uh, justice under a tree relates more to a process of South African constitutionalism which is embedded in regional vernacular and a sense of post-apartheid identity formation. So I critically analyse each of these themes um, 
by examining how specific artworks and architectural features intervene in the appearance and the performance of the court, shaping how the constitution can be understood in different ways. And so these material interventions and the space they create become key to the provision of justice at the court. So one example I examined and I've been, included an image of it on the screen is William Kentridge's um, print entitled Sleeper Black. So in interviews, people who work at the court uh, regularly cited this artwork as an example of the right to freedom of expression uh, for two reasons. And, and the quote on the screen kind of summarizes these two reasons. On the one hand, it's because it's an image of a nude man. The artwork is perceived to challenge conventional paradigms of female nudity in artworks and stands in contrast to the portraits uh, of male judges that are normally encountered in courts and legal spaces. Um, adding to this, the subject of the print appears to be lying in rather a vulnerable position. And so in contrast to other images of nude men, which when they do appear in artworks, tend to be in positions of power, um, kind of think Renaissance depictions of the ideal male body, it's, it's not just that this artwork is of a nude man, it's this, this artwork is of a vulnerable nude man, which is significant in the context of the court. On the other hand, the location of the artwork contributes to how it supports freedom of expression. It's an image of a nude man that's hung prominently in the public entrance to the court because this is one of the first artworks people encounter as they enter the court space. So it's not just important that this artwork depicts a vulnerable nude man, it's significant that it's encountered early and at the entrance to the court. And these two provocations about content and location combine to connect the artwork to the right of freedom of expression, suggesting that this freedom arises from the ability to show an image of a nude man in a civic institution, um, which in the book I critique as rather a thin conception of uh, freedom of expression, um, yet it's un unexpected in the context of the court because such legal spaces are more conventionally circumscribed, circumscribed by conservative aesthetics. So it's not that the artwork itself is about freedom of expression. In another context, Sleeper Black might be considered really an innocuous image um, of a nude man in a cartoonish style. However, placed in the court, the artwork takes on new meaning. And as a result, the justice institution affects the artwork, and in turn, the art reinforces a notion central to conceptions of justice at the court, freedom of expression. So linking this back to the theoretical framework, the encounters generated by the artwork and the space it creates are important actions in the perception and provision of justice at the court. I go on to explore three um, narratives which I argue are dominant in the court's art collection. And these are narratives which recognise people, community and time as key to the project of justice and democracy in South Africa. These narratives play a central role in shaping the court's larger transitional justice story because they draw attention to how the impossibility of attaining universal justice is what drives justice practices and the enactment of human rights for particular people and particular communities at particular times. So one artwork that I suggest really epitomises this is a series of body maps that were created by the Mambanani Women's Group in Cape Town, uh, two of which I've included on the screen. Each body map is a self-portrait created by a woman who is HIV positive. And the body maps came out of a workshop which was part of a Medicine Sans Frontiers pilot antiretroviral program. The processes of body mapping, uh, which is a form of art therapy, was intended to help women come to terms with their diagnosis. And at the time of the workshop in 2002, antiretroviral drugs weren't available through public health centres. And then that's a position the court changed when it ruled on the access to HIV AIDS treatment and the right to healthcare requiring the government to provide access to these health services, uh, particularly for pregnant women to combat the transmission of HIV from mother to child. And so through these body maps, uh, there is a direct visual connection between the actual practice of justice enacted by the court and the artworks which envisage the subject of that justice. 
Uh, the recognition of this defined community gives a human face to the court's decisions, portraying who is the subject of judgment and for what is the purpose served. I conclude this part of the book by theorizing the court's art collection as this new kind of visual jurisprudence that I mentioned, analyzing the ways in which people, especially judges, talk about the art collection in order to show how artworks at the court become central to the bodies of aesthetic knowledge that shape the appearance of justice and that shape how justice is understood. So on the screen, I mean, I've broken the cardinal rule about PowerPoint presentations and I've put up too much text on one slide, uh, but I really wanted to include quotes um, from, I really wanted to include quotes from some of the interviews about how the judges actually think and feel about the art collection. Uh, both of the judges quoted on the screen talk about the importance of the art collection in creating empathy and enriching their understanding of humanity. As the first judge says, art helps one understand the healing conditions better than the law does. And as the second says, art makes me in a sense softer, more human and able to understand human beings a lot better. While the law clerk talks about art as creating an awareness of the bigger picture and the importance of the detailed work of the law. As they say, it's only through those emotive reactions to stories that we remember the deep importance of the difference between a semicolon and a colon. So I argue that in such close proximity to the court, the art collection inhabits a unique position in which the assumptions of justice and justices and what it means to uphold the constitution can be probed. And this creates a visual jurisprudence that reflects both the values that underpin the court, as well as the ways of practicing justice in post-apartheid South Africa. In part two of the book, I explore transitional justice on the global stage through the South Africa Pavilion at the Art Biennale, Venice Art Biennale. So every two years, um, the Art Biennale brings together contemporary exhibitions of around 85 nations. It draws in heads of state, ambassadors, ministers and diplomats who want to participate in and really assure the quality of their state's representation on this global stage. Um, it's really a Goliath exhibition that aims to take the pulse of the contemporary art scene, um, as well as a nation's identity, and capture a global artistic moment. So it's, it really becomes a global political opportunity. And I start with a historical overview of South Africa's relationship to the Biennale. Uh, in 1968, protests at the Biennale changed how it took place. And these were part of the global student protests that were, that were sweeping the globe at the time. And these changes included banning South Africa from exhibiting, reflecting the global cultural boycott of the apartheid regime. And it wasn't until 1993, with the prospect of transition from apartheid to democracy, that South Africa was actually invited uh, back to the Biennale. And through this invitation um, to exhibit at the Biennale, South Africa was being rewarded um, for its political change. So by chronicle, chronicling South Africa's appearances and exhibitions at the Biennale, um, a few examples of which I've just included on the screen, I explore the complex international and national politics and diplomatic negotiations um, which are actually involved in becoming and remaining a member state of this international organisation. And I argue that South Africa's participation in this space continues to be deeply affected by international and national politics uh, and its long absence from the Biennale really reverberates through the way in which it represents itself to the international community and seeks to establish itself as a member state of this organisation. Because since being invited back to the Biennale, um, the South African exhibitions have been really different to those um, exhibited by other states, in that South Africa has been very focused on showing a historical breadth of artistic practice, really reinserting its art history back into the Biennale space, um, whereas other member states who have been more long-standing participants tend to show very contemporary artworks and installations that arguably aren't as explicitly linked um, to a sense of national identity.
So I then examine the geopolitics of the Biennale, because the Biennale transforms the local city space of Venice into a global artscape that really has two cradles of influence and prominence, the Giardini and the Arsenale, which house the majority of national exhibitions. And these are highlighted um, in red on the, the bottom map on the screen. So in the garden compound in the Giardini, 29 permanent pavilions, uh, which were built by states who are long-standing members of the Biennale, and they're laid out like, like mini art embassies. So I've included on the screen um, some images of these pavilions, um, some examples from of Belgium, France, Russia, and Germany. In the Giardini are the geopolitical axes of the mid-20th century, a grouping that really has its roots in post-war Europe. And by contrast, the Arsenale houses semi-permanent rented spaces of states that are new to the Biennale. And these newer member states have to apply to exhibit on an annual basis. And they're butted against each other in long corridors of crumbling ex-neighbor warehouses, uh, which you can see on the top of the screen. And these warehouses are actually watched over by an active military base uh, next door. So the newer states, those on the, the margins of this art bonanza, um, are dotted around the city. And churches, palazzos, and courtyards become temporary exhibition spaces. And so they're the remainder of the books you can see in the map in the bottom corner. So states jostle for the best locations, knowing that although it's not possible to join the imperial ranks of the Giardini, the closer they are to this um, epicenter, the more visible and the more visited, and arguably the more remembered their exhibitions will be. Pavilions in this space become proxies through which states present an image of themselves to the international community. And so in the book, I contrast South Africa's 2013 national pavilion uh, with that of the United Arab Emirates, um, because the two states shared an exhibition space in the Arsenale. And I do this in order to show how comparisons between states are really forced upon them by virtue of exhibiting at the Biennale, arguing that these artscapes provide fertile ground for states to offer an image of themselves, but these images are not necessarily perceived how the states always intend. So I go on to explore the exhibition which was entitled Imaginary Fact um, that was displayed in the 2013 South Africa Pavilion. And this was a large group exhibition showing the work of 17 artists. What I found was that three key narratives about violence really emerged from this <coughs> exhibition. The unresolved violence of apartheid era crimes, the structural violence of pervasive practices of discrimination, and the physical violence to which people continue to be subjected. So I analyzed three artworks which I suggest epitomize these narratives, and I've, I've included these on the screen. On the left is one part of David Kalwani's The Journey, which details the events which led to the death of the leader of the black consciousness movement and anti-apartheid activist Steve Biko by the security forces in 1977. In the center is Sue Williamson's For 30 Years Next to His Heart, which documents the apartheid pass laws that required every black South African over the age of 16 to carry a dom pass, um, a kind of pass book that controlled their ability to move around the country. And on the right is Zanelli Maholi's Faces and Phases, which is a series of portraits designed to restore black queer visibility. And I argue that these three narratives are important actions in South Africa's transition because they warn against the repetition of violence they document the structures of violence, and they expose the continuing practices of violence in the new South Africa. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about Maholi's work because her practice is really interesting in how it unsettles the state's diplomatic narrative. Maholi describes herself as a visual activist, not as an artist, and in this work, faces and phases, there are 10 gaps in the grid of 200 portraits which signify the missing portraits of people who have been the victims of hate crimes. Homophobic violence is an ongoing problem in South Africa. In particular, the nation is experiencing a backlash of crimes targeted specifically at lesbian women who are perceived as representing a direct and specific threat to the status quo and violence often takes the form of corrective rape where men rape women in order to cure them of their lesbianism. 
So these crimes are not only underreported due to the stigma associated with them, but they're also underrecorded by the police and seldom prosecuted as hate crimes on the basis of sexual orientation. And this is a situation that contributes to the silence around such prejudicial, uh, prejudice related violence. And the simultaneous presence and absence of these portraits draws attention to this violence. So while Faces and Phases is about restoring black queer visibility, it's simultaneously an indictment of current discrimin discrimination in South Africa, it's a call to action. Maholi is advocating for equal rights and treatment, drawing attention to the violence and discrimination faced by the LGBTI community. Including faces and phases in the South Africa Pavilion also draws attention to the politics within South Africa which surrounds Maholi's visual activism. Because in 2009, the then Arts and Culture Minister refused to open an exhibition that featured Maholi's work on the basis, as the minister described, that it was immoral because it depicted images of lesbians and in doing so, the minister said the exhibition was against nation building. So this vision of a nation being circumscribed by heteronormativity really betrays um, a sense of a disintegrating rainbow nationalism in South Africa, but it also echoes apartheid era strategies of silence and alterity. So what's interesting is that four years later, Maholi is representing South Africa um, in the Biennale, and the next arts and culture minister uh, talks about Maholi as an important ambassador for the state. And in my interview with the Consul General of South Africa to Milan, he talked about how it was actually in fact vital for South Africa to exhibit Maholi's work in this context, because it highlights how South Africa is different to other countries on the African continent who criminalize homosexuality. And so there is a vast gap that appears um, in Maholi's work uh, between the conceptual liberalness of South Africa's constitution and its actual political practice. Externally, on the international stage, Maholi's work is embraced, but internally, on the national stage, uh, there's a lot more tension surrounding it. And Maholi's artwork really complicates the government's diplomatic narrative by exposing the ongoing struggle for representation in South Africa. So I, include the, I conclude this part of the book by theorizing imaginary fact um, as a unique instance of cultural diplomacy. It plays a paradoxical role in a process of nation building because it presents a dual image of a nation that's on the one hand struggling with ongoing internal complexities while projecting a collective narrative of a state that has undergone a difficult transition and come out the other side to reassert itself in the international community. Uh, by examining South Africa's conception of cultural diplomacy, which um, it presents in government white papers over the last 10 years or so, I show how the official image of South Africa as a global competitor, a transition nation, really sits uncomfortably with the artist's image of South Africa as a transitioning nation that remains um, circumscribed by ongoing challenges to human rights. And I argue that this establishes a global, uh, that lovely term, global local, image of a state which is in tension with South Africa's foreign policy agenda. So to conclude, the South African case study reveals that the meeting point uh, and relationship between transitional justice and visual art creates new political spaces uh, of recognition and representation. Art is embedded in creative state building, both internally and externally. Art is fundamental to the appearance, the understanding, and the provision of justice in South Africa, and of South African justice at its highest judicial level. Art is critical to how South Africa engages international relations by asserting its successful transition while acknowledging that justice is ongoing. And the state uses visual art from the inside out to reconceptualize the South African justice system and from the outside in to re-engage the international community with the South African state. And so I just want to leave you with this thought. Without the proper recognition of the relationship between art and transitional justice, and without a deeper understanding of how and where this occurs, the ability to comprehend the complex ways in which the past haunt the present is impeded. And the danger is that without art, 
Transitional justice will fail to fully comprehend and respond to the injustices, which are the long-term cause of conflict. Uh, as one constitutional court judge said, human understanding and the need for human understanding is actually the true link between art and justice. Thank you.